Even as television was embracing youth programming, the studios still didn't get it. But Bert Schneider and Bob Rafelson sure did. Flush with money from the success of the Monkees, they knew there was an untapped audience for something different. Peter started talking about what at that time was called the loners, because I had called it the loners, the easy rider. Jack Nicholson had actually talked Bert into this, I believe, by saying, these bike movies make money. You'll make your money back. You're not going to lose any money here. So uh, Schneider said, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the money to go and shoot this. You shoot it in 16 millimeter. And if I like what I see, then I'll give you the rest of the money to make the you know, feature movie. And I was crazy. There was no question about it cans of films at me and said, that's it, you know. I said, I said, well, if you can't take any more, give me the film, I don't trust you anymore. He said, you want the film? Here's the film, he starts throwing. So we get into a fist fight, pushes me into a room that Peter's in bed with Karen and Tony Basil, and uh, a fight proceeds uh, whereupon uh, uh, it ends and uh, uh, everybody leaves. After shooting the acid trip scene at the cemetery, Hopper and Fonda return to Los Angeles. I get back, and unbeknownst to me, that Peter and Bill Hayward, my brother-in-law, came back from New Orleans and offered to give back the uh, $20,000 that, uh, that obviously that I was a crazy person. And what they had done was they started taping me, my screaming and my raving and ranting. And they played this for, for Bert Schneider and Jack Nicholson. And Bert said, well, he sounds excited, but you know something? I hired this man to direct this movie. He's going to direct this movie. For Easy Rider, which was interesting, there wasn't a motorcycle on it. The phrase on the top said, a man went looking for America and couldn't find it anywhere. When we all, the hippies, when we all arrived up to the sales office at Columbia when it was down on Gower Street, we thought, what are these guys going to know? We walked in and saw that. That's got to be it. It's amazing. That came out of... Far out. Put it in. It's great. As Columbia prepared Easy Rider for release, United Artists was about to start the most controversial studio picture to date. There, there was at UA at that time this extraordinary group of people who had an extraordinary concept about how to finance and distribute films. Well, UA had created a world that the majors were not aware of, and studios didn't understand the concept of giving creative control of a movie to a filmmaker. We did it with every filmmaker that we were in business with. One filmmaker UA wanted to work with was John Schlesinger, who had recently scored with Darling, which won its star, future Beatty Paramore Julie Christie, an Academy Award. I can go to John Schlesinger as I did and said, we want to make a movie with you. What do you want to do? And he can say, well, there's this little book, you'll never do it, it's very dark, and it you know, turns out to be Midnight Cowboy. Uh, it never would have been made under the studio system. John was like, at a real turning point at, that, at the cowboy time. He was in the closet. His close friends all knew that he was gay, but he was desperate to break out. He wanted to, he's a gay man, and he wanted to have a gay partner, and he wanted to live a gay life. And he had all these archaic ideas that if the crew knew that he was gay, that he'd ask them to do something and say, ah, fuck you, faggot. You faggot, get out of here. I mean, these childhood dreams that, that, that must have tormented him and all that. So I just said, look, John, it's our movie. If we don't like someone, we'll throw him out. He got it through his head that maybe it would be all right, although he was very frightened. And then he fell in love. He fell in love with a man who he's still with now, 39 years later. And John was like, you know, any one of us, if you're in love, I mean, you're totally on fire with ideas, and he was inspired, there's no question about it. And be the first studio film released with an X rating. And the film blew everybody away so badly that he actually created a category for it. So it could be given a prize at con. It was tremendous. People did not know how to take us at all. They just, uh, you know, we were all bearded or long haired and, you know, it was very far out. <laughs> Nobody thought that Easy Rider was really going to become a seminal film, though. I mean, I thought it was just another bike movie. And there'd been a lot of dialogue about Easy Rider because they were having all kinds of problems putting it together, and this bunch of hippies had gone out, and they were stoned, and they made this movie, and, and it was never going to go together, and they'd spent 
you know, six, seven hundred thousand, whatever it was, and that was kind of the rap on the on the movie that that at least we heard, and then it went out and it it was baffo. I mean, it was genuine shock. To figure out why anybody was going to see that movie, and that was just. It seems to me that that was just as the as the change was happening. I mean, it was. Vietnam. I mean, it was uh, long hair was becoming more popular. They'd lost their audience. There was they had not they had not addressed their audience. They had not addressed what their audience were into. We'd gone through the '60s and nobody had ever seen drugs smoked without you know going out and committing some kind of murder or atrocity of some kind. When you went to see a movie like Easy Rider and when you saw these guys really smoking grass by the fire. And really, the camaraderie was was warm and real and rare. And then I think they went a bit far because I kept seeing movies where people vomited. Uh. First time I worked for Sam, he wrote the Rifleman. He hadn't directed at this point, but he came around the set and would whisper to me, "Cause they wanted to try this, once you do this on." So I was the guest star in the Rifleman, which sold and. He always got an income from. So that was when I first knew him. And he was one of the few guys that I knew in, in the inside of the, that smoked grass. So he and I used to smoke in his office. <laughs> I knew Sam at the time of Wild Bunch, uh, I, uh, hanging around him. And I um, uh, wrote a long article about him. And uh, I, I just thought he was brilliant, brilliant. And I saw the three and a half, three hour and 45 minute version of The Wild Bunch, which I thought was the most brilliant thing I'd ever, ever fucking seen. The Wild Bunch was, in part, an allegory for America's increasingly violent involvement in Vietnam. But fortunately, the violence of the new cinema, in Hollywood at least, had been limited to the screen. And for most of those at the top of the emerging new Hollywood, life was a nonstop party with an unending flow of beautiful women and men eager to explore the new sexual freedom that was enhanced and encouraged with the best drugs money could buy. Everybody knew everybody else, and it seemed like the high would last forever. Then on the morning of August 9th, 1969, Charlie Manson's followers broke into Roman Polanski's house in Benedict Canyon and butchered Polanski's pregnant wife, Sharon Tate, and four others while the director was away in Europe. Rumors flew of orgies and drug abuse. There was a lot of talk about drugs. Sharon not only didn't use drugs, she didn't touch alcohol, she didn't smoke cigarettes. The last film she made was not a very happy experience for her, but her greatest picture she was doing was her pregnancy. I never seen a woman more preoccupied with it. The house is open now. The police has released it. And you can go and see the orgy place. You will see a lot of blood all over the place. Cradles, baby clothes, and that's all. We all knew Sharon, and we knew, you know, Jay Sebring. We knew these, these people that were part of our everyday life out here. And so they're all chopped up and messed around. A lot of rage in there, huh? Well, there was a lot of rage in the hippie communities, in the hippie communities, and just on the street in the hippie sides because the voice was not being heard, because the war was going on, because it was still whacked out, because we were bullying it. 